down the hammer and pick up the pencil. You're about to listen to the Savvy Radio Show. Learn from real life real estate investors, experience revealed with the Savvy Landlord as your host. Thanks for having me, guys. It's just really cool to be able to talk to you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand out something because I like this because some of the stuff I'm going to be going over. I always get asked, well, how do I, how do I win my claim? Like, even if I don't want to use a public adjuster, what do I need to know? Why do I need to hire a public adjuster? You know, those kinds of things. Has anyone ever filed a claim? Insurance related, rip property, any of that stuff? Okay. How was your experience? <laughs> Uh, Anyone have any good experiences? Good and bad. Good. You yeah. should have some good, some bad. Okay. I've got a bunch. You got a bunch? All right. Well, then this will be very helpful for you. So a lot of people ask, well, well, let me start here. Does anyone know what a proof of loss is? Raise your hand if you know what it is. Proof of loss? Anyone ever heard of that? Never. Okay. Oh, yeah. Doreen has, yeah. Um, in your insurance policy, there's this thing that says you're required to submit your proof of loss to the insurance carrier, but several of you raised your hands and didn't even know what that is. Why aren't the carriers asking you for it? Because they want to calculate your claim for you instead of you calculating it on your own. So what I passed around is the details of what a proof of loss is, why you need to provide one. I'll tell you a little bit about myself too. I, uh, I worked for the insurance carrier for about seven years. I've handled thousands of claims. Uh, the highest one I've handled, I think, is about a million dollars and down. I've done hurricane, wildfires, hailstorms, uh, vandalism claims. You name it, I've probably covered it. I haven't cracked, I've just barely cracked into commercial, so commercial's a little outside of my expertise. I would have to hire more experts to handle those kinds of claims. Um, my last position with the insurance company was a national reinspector. I did that traveling all around the US, and my job was to audit other adjusters for accuracy. The reason why that's important and that kind of sets me apart is because I catch things that a lot of adjusters don't realize. If you think of it this way, if an adjuster is trained by their supervisor and their manager, and let's say they work for three or four years out in the field, they only know their way of doing it and their manager's way of doing it. They don't see how other people do it. Well, as a reinspector, I got to see how everyone did it and could find like the niche, you know, paying for it this way, do you pay for this kind of hail, do I pay for that kind of hail, how many hits does it take, you know, all that stuff. I've seen all, all over the board. And that, that kind of gives me some unique qualifications, so. I like to start off with the proof of loss because it's super important. A lot of people are like, well, I'll just fill it out. If the insurance company asks you for proof of loss, they might be investigating for fraud or it might be a fire claim since it's more uh, routine on claims like that. Uh, what they'll give you is like a two-page form. And a lot of times, they'll fill in the numbers for you, and then you sign it, and they you, cut you a check. So if, if you ever get presented with proof of loss from the insurance carrier, always seek advice, either from an attorney or an adjuster, before you sign. Because when you sign that, you're probably releasing your claim. So they're very final. A lot of people are like, well, I don't even know what proof of loss is. Well, the correct proof of loss, this is one claim. These are two proofs of loss for one claim. One was mitigation work from a pipe burst, and one was the rest of the claim. These are double-sided, and you see how thick these are? I'll let you guys look at them so you can see. This is what a proof of loss should look like. That's not the entire claim. The entire claim file is about this big, double-sided. Pictures, detailed estimate, you're supposed to provide ages, calculate the depreciation, all of that stuff. That's why these proofs of loss are really important. And as a public, if you hire a public adjuster, this is what you're hiring them to do, to prepare, investigate, present your claim. Now you guys are free to ask questions and stop me and all that stuff, so. Let me get one of these so I can go off of this. So, hail, uh, you guys have a lot of room rentals or you're doing flips, make sure that you're checking the roof before you buy it. Um, if you don't know what hail looks like, you can Google it. Um, Hay engineering, hail damage, what does it look like? And you'll get a bunch of pictures. 
The characteristics of hail are missing granules in a kind of a circular pattern. Hail's not round, it's jagged, so do know that they don't have to be round, but a circular pattern. Missing granules. Uh, embedded granules, those are the rocks that are on the shingle. Embedded granules that are pushed down into the matting by the hail. That's the second characteristic I would look for. I would look for collateral damage around the property like dents on gutters, um, splatter marks on fences, dented AC fins, holes in screens, dents on the garage door. If you're seeing collateral damage, you should definitely check the roof. If you don't see any dents on the gutters or dents or splatter marks or any collateral, probably the roof's okay. More than likely, unless there's some kind of weird situation where they replaced all that stuff but didn't replace the roof. So that's some of the characteristics. Um, there's an argument about well, how, what constitutes damage from hail. Uh, the generally accepted definition would be fractured matting. So the hail hits the roof surface hard enough to create fractures or even micro fractures in the underlying matting. What will happen is several years later, that'll wear into a hole in the shingle and will cause leaks. Your shingle life is also greatly diminished when the hail knocks a bunch of granules off and puts these hits on the roof. If you want to know whether a roof is totaled, if you're, you know, untrained eye, but you've kind of looked it up on the, online, you know, here, here's pictures of it. I kind of know what I'm looking for. If you're finding four really solid hits per square, chances are the roof's totaled. A lot of insurance come as square, I'm sorry, square is 100 square feet. So a 10 by 10 area on a slope, all you need is really four solid hail hits, and that would point to me as a professional that there's prob that roof's probably totaled. You need a few more than that to technically total a roof, but it depends on aging condition. So do we have any questions about hail and what constitutes damage and all that stuff? All right. Have you guys ever bought a roof, bought a house, and then found out later had hail damage? All the time. Okay. <laughs> well, now now you can save yourself a few thousand dollars if you'll just take that one extra step, put a ladder on the roof, and go look. If you're okay with being on roofs, looking at it. A lot of the homes around here are not steep, so. Yep. Something I found once that <clears throat> I had a steel door, and you said that's got damage, and I was like, no, it's fine. You took a piece of chalk and you run it down the door, it's a little harder to find sometimes, but yep. you can find, it's just a little tip that I found. Adjusters use chalk on every claim. I go through a whole thing of chalk almost every claim, so. Sure. That way when it rains, it washes off and all that stuff, but it helps for the pictures. All right, so has anyone, have you been through a claim, lost some money on it, and you kind of took your lumps because the process was too long or too hard, or any, have you had any problems with claims that you want to talk about? Yep. I had a multifamily claim. Uh -huh. <clears throat> the adjuster came out on a multifamily claim. We went over it all day long. He approved a million seven fifty. Uh -huh to replace everything that was damaged as tornado type hail. Okay. <clears throat> uh, a week later he got fired. Mm -hmm. The regional adjuster came out and handed me a check for 500,000. Mm -hmm. I said no. So I fought him personally. I kept threatening him with you. Oh really? <laughs> for, uh, for a year and a half. And yeah. I finally settled for a million two. Okay, so you settled it. But I had a but How much did you lose in I settling? Had, I didn't. You didn't? You, no. you ended up collecting? I ended up collecting the whole thing. Okay, good. Because I held them, I held their feet to the fire because they had... Now, did you use my name specifically? No, 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 no. no. You might no. owe me some of that. But <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I'm trying to stress yeah. here is I had a three-ring binder that's three inches thick yeah. of email correspondence where I had tied them up in a knot. Right. With what the original adjuster had, his notes, pictures conversation down to the T. I recorded the conversation, everything. They could not back up. Unfortunately, most insurers don't think to do that. So record your calls. If you're not recording, you definitely want to write down everything you said and everything they said, who, you, who said it, and what date and time that that conversation occurred. Those notes need to be contemporaneous, meaning they have to be in order, They've got to be taken near at the time that the conversation took place. 
Those notes, once they're deemed contemporaneous, they can be used later. I'm not an attorney, and nothing I tell you today is legal advice. You have to talk to an attorney for that. Those notes can be used later if you have to go to court. Just like, and just remember, <coughs> everything you said, the insurance carrier will write down in their file, and they will <coughs> paraphrase it how they want to paraphrase it. So you need to make sure you have your own notes. Otherwise, if it goes to litigation later or whatever, all they get to present is everything they have, and then you have no notes to show for it. So um, take lots of pictures. Uh, I usually say the picture should tell a story. If you have, if you absolutely have to label your picture to know what it is, it probably wasn't taken in the right order or uh, taken at the right angle or something. Because like the way I take my pictures, if you look in this example I sent around, overview of the room or area or elevation, close-up of damage on, in that room or on that elevation, and the damage is almost always in the center of the picture. So even if there are no labels, I know, and anyone that's trained to look at hail and all that damage, they know what those pictures mean. And so that's why I would suggest when you're taking pictures, and I see insured pictures all the time, and they're just like random pictures all over the place. Well, it's hard to actually tell a story with that. So kind of keep that in mind. Like my in my routine, I do uh, front, and then I go counterclockwise. And I always do it, no matter if the, fin the gate's on that side or not, I walk all the way around just to make sure I take my pictures in order. And that's how important it is. When I get on the roof, I take uh, test square pictures then close-up of hell hits in that test square. Um, if you need to show how big something is, get a ruler or something next to your picture to show how big it is. Uh, let's see what else. Pictures that show what kind of materials you have, the number of layers on a roof, the number of layers of siding, number of layers of flooring if you have flooring damage. All those things are really important to prove your claim. Uh, what's one of the common questions I get? Do I need to get bids? I always hear that. Well, if you're going to get a public adjuster, the answer is no. Don't get any bids because the contractors you're going to get bids from are probably not going to be retail, full-blown retail prices. Once you get those written bids, we might have an obligation to submit that information to the insurance carrier because we're submitting this proof of loss, right? One thing I didn't mention is it's sworn, meaning it's a sworn statement to the insurance company. Everything you tell the carrier or submit to the carrier is binding, whether it's sworn to or not. But a sworn statement, definitely serious and needs to be accurate, right? Well, if we say the damage is 30000 but you're getting bids from people that have no workman's comp insurance, they don't have as much overhead because they're just Joe Schmo, they're actually subcontractors, you know, that's kind of a, that's kind of weird. That's an awkward situation later down the road. if. You're trying to say, well, the insurance co company owes me this much, but I have bids for this much. It won't go well. So just don't get bids if you're working with a public adjuster. If you're contesting your claim on your own, definitely get bids. But remember, the insurance company only owes you for the cheapest one. So don't get bids from people you're not going to use. And make sure they're very, very thorough. Because if they miss something in that bid, the insurance company is probably not going to pay for it later. You'd have, it's like a really big uphill battle. Because then they're like, well, you're a contractor. Because think about it this way. We've all had contractors out, and they usually say the roof's totaled. You know, even if there's minor damage, right? That could happen. We have good contractors and bad contractors, just like anything else. So the insurance company, this is their perception of it. Well, if a contractor said it, it's that's like the maximum. But it's probably less than that. That's the way they look at it. So just keep that in mind when you're submitting information to the carrier. A um, couple other things I usually tell insureds. You can lose thousands of dollars in what you say to an insurance company within a matter of minutes. I have seen it happen. I tell people, I can't stop you from talking to your insurance company as your public adjuster. I can't stop you. But if you choose to talk to them and you lose thousands of dollars, that's not on me, right? The reason is they ask you questions that you don't necessarily know the ramifications of the answers a lot of times the questions are leading and they're leading on purpose and you tend to answer them based on information you recall in an instant. Well, unfortunately our minds don't work like that. You gotta, you gotta really think about the question and then your answer and you probably have to qualify it because they, they asked you a leading question. <coughs> well, once you tell them that and they put in a log note, 
calling him the next day and telling him, hey, I, I misspoke, it actually just looks worse. So you just can't take it back. Um, okay, depreciation. A lot of people want to know how to maximize their own claim. Depreciation is taken based on the age, useful life, and condition of the, the item that's damaged. So that means on a 30-year roof, if it's 15 years old, and it's a $10,000 roof, they're going to deduct five grand. Uh, most of you don't have replacement costs on roofs. You probably don't even know that. So that means if you have a $2,500 deductible and a $5,000 deduction for depreciation, your check is $2,500. Guys, if you don't know the age of your roof, don't guess. And don't be generous on the age. Be conservative. Um, I'm not advocating lying about it. I want you to tell the truth, but if you don't know, you don't know. Um, I can estimate the age of materials based on its condition, and rarely do I get pushback. Once you tell the carrier how old it is, or how old you think it is, they almost always go with that. I rarely have pushback on depreciation. Almost never. Because they would have to prove I'm wrong, and they, they can't. If I don't know exactly how old it is, they definitely can't prove it. So they just go with my numbers. I'm also conservative on depreciation in that I take a little bit different stance. Like, for example, some of the carriers are depreciating the entire amount of labor and materials. <coughs> well, if it's a labor-only operation, why in the hell does that depreciate? It doesn't. General contractor overhead and profit. Why would you depreciate that? It's labor only. Detach and reset. Why would you depreciate it? I don't appreciate that stuff, and they shouldn't either, but they will do it if you don't push on that issue at the very beginning. Well, that amounts to lots and lots of money. Lots of money. So <coughs> depreciation is a big one. You can win that top dollar, but if you lose on depreciation, you're still out. The bottom line is you're coming out of pocket big time on that deal. Does anyone know what general contractor overhead and profit is? No? For multi Oh no, you items. need to know For this. For multi items, are you getting the general contractor to cover? Yes. More than like roof. How much do they charge? 20%. Jen and Jen. So I'm about to correct a few things here. This is awesome. I didn't even know this till recently, and I've been doing insurance for a long time. 10 and 10, believe it or not, was a myth created by the insurance companies. Contractors just kind of went along with it, and unfortunately, there a lot of contractors are not sophisticated enough to know what their actual overhead is. It has now been determined if you ha have a contractor and you, they have a real business that's thriving and growing, their overhead's much higher than 10%. <coughs> I'm still not submitting more than 20%, 10 and 10 yet, because I don't have concrete white papers to support it. Because as a PA, we have to have concrete information because they're definitely they're not going to listen to anything I say. It has to be someone else. But um, yeah, it's, it's usually, I'm reading numbers as high as 25% for overhead plus profit, 10 to 15%. So just an FYI, when you're dealing with contractors, keep in mind they need to thrive and they need to grow, otherwise they go out of business. So you gotta be fair, real estate investors, I know you're cheap. You gotta be fair to those contractors, keep that in mind. Yep. Could you give the insurance company evidence of your overhead and show that it is 15 or 20%? And you're referring to yourself as a con construction company? I am. Do you have a separate LLC for that? Yes. Okay, if you have a separate construction company, your construction company is entitled to its overhead and profit. And so I'm about to answer something for you. If you haven't been doing it, have, are you part of Level the Playing Field? Have you ever heard of that? No. There's a, there's a Facebook group called Level the Playing Field for uh, contractors in um, any, any professional dealing with repairs, mainly insurance related. You will find out that the way you support more than 20% is you have your CPA run your numbers and tell you what your overhead and profit percentage is. All the time, it's gonna be more than 20%, that overhead. You submit that documentation on your claim and that's how you can get more than 20% approved by the carrier. But I think you were asking, well, can I even add it? And the answer is yes, astoundingly yes. If there's more than one trade, if there's three trades, four or five, six trades, a trade is a separate uh, company coming out and doing the work. If there's more than a few, it needs to be overhead and profit because someone has to manage those subcontractors. Someone has to go purchase materials. Someone has to carry 
um, workman's comp insurance on those people and liability insurance and you have to manage and watch their repairs you have to make sure they're doing quality work you have to do a punch I mean there's just so much a general contractor does ultimately have to do a lot of people don't realize all the work they do but you got to pay them and they're entitled to compensation well as it stands right now 10 and 10 is what the insurance companies pay without that support if the rule is if a general contractor is reasonably likely to be necessary I know it doesn't say three trades or more it doesn't it doesn't the guideline is not specific that's intentional by the insurance company so you can get dipped with the same insurance company the exact same claim have two different adjusters and have OMP on one which is 20% it's a lot of money and then OM, no OMP on the other as a public adjuster I normally can get that added on I mean I definitely fight for it all the way to the end so I've got one now that that's the only issue, but it's with Allstate. So they're going to be like boxing with me until I'm done with them. Um, so general contractor overhead and property. Now, I didn't make that up. Allstate got in a lot of trouble because they hired the McKinsey Consulting Firm. And the McKinsey Consulting, this will, they'll never live this down. And what I'm telling you is public record, so I am not giving you any information that's proprietary. McKinsey came in and consulted for Allstate on how to reduce their claims payouts. One of their approaches was, you're in good hands until you're not, and then we're going to use boxing gloves. And they had the graphic, and this has been proven in court, and this was attached to court pleadings, and this is why they won their case. Remember this is all state. <laughs> boxing gloves. That's their approach. No, I didn't say it. It's on, you can look it up on the internet. Look it up. McKinsey, boxing gloves, all state. It'll all come up. They'll <laughs> never get away from it either. It's, 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 the damage is already done. They should have settled the case before all that stuff came out. Kept doing good hands. <laughs> I um, know, it's so on, awful. On good paper. hands to boxing gloves. I was just like, oh, I can't imagine being all state in that case. Um, okay, so another myth about overhead and profit. <clears throat> you know, they don't pay it on routine health claims. They definitely don't pay it to you, the policyholder. If you just file a claim, you won't see it. It'll never come. You can ask for it there and can put it in. They just avoid the issue altogether. A little rarely known fact is your insurance premiums already include an amount for general contractor overhead and profit so by not paying gc omp on a claim they are keeping or keeping part of your earned premiums because when they calculate the rebuild of your house you can look at farmers has um, um a rebuild explanation document they send out and on there it says general contractor overhead and profit. And guess what? It's like 25%. They only pay 20, but they calculate your premium on 25 and then they don't pay it on routine health claims. Wow. Beyond me. So just keep that in mind. Um, so on a $10,000 claim, OMP is like four grand or 22, yeah, two grand. My claims, my health claims tend to be anywhere between 50, 15, 18, all the way up. All the way up, I had a hundred thousand dollar health claim, but the routine ones are 20, 25, 35. If you're much lower than 15, you pr they're probably missing something. I've been on some small roofs, just one recently. Actually, he got a two thousand dollar check, so he called me. Uh, it was a twenty five thousand dollar claim. Four thousand was not four or five thousand was not covered because he did not have ordinance and law, also known as code upgrade coverage. So you guys need to know this because you are losing money because I'm telling you, I stumbled on something. Code, up yes. So, in the middle of the thing, I do have the upgrade. Okay. So the person came out and the adjuster was on the line and they were like FaceTime. And so inside of the house, there's no damage. Is this a wind and hail claim? Pardon? Wind and hail claim? Yes. Okay. Yes, and so the storm went by and I said, oh, I better get my roof. It's getting kind of old too, so check it out. But I don't see any damage inside the house. So I right. said, there's, there's no damage inside the house. Just check, you know, the That's pretty normal. Property, okay. Right? But he didn't go into the garage. Later on, the contractors I was trying to get numbers on, they said there's damage inside mm -hmm. the garage. Right? Yeah, water stains. And stuff like that. 
but it's, it's, I, I get confused about the decking. And it's like, what is, what is, what, what is? Yeah, this is a big, this is a okay, big issue, guys, and most of you don't have great. coverage for it. It's going and on the, right now. The structure originally before me, I don't think they did it right. So my situation is, if I put on the new roof, but then the rest of the stuff is not to code. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like that's not the right thing to do, but I'm like in a pickle. Mm -hmm. Like, if I just do what they covered. Okay, but you have code book, upgrade coverage. I do have code upgrade. Are the code issues related to the loss? Meaning you have to do them because you had a loss? In other words, you would not have to do them but for the loss. For the loss. So if. So if there was no loss, uh -huh. would you still have to repair these issues? They were functional at the time. It's still standing. Yeah. But Give me an example of one of the code issues <coughs> that you're talking about. Um, I think like if, I think what the contractor said is that he had to rip. There's two layers there. Okay, I got and it. So I have to, and we're then I have to do the new decking, and then the the frame like new decking. the damage. That's the, the issue. The holes or whatever he has to change that. But that's not okay. Right. So decking, that's it's huge right now. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Decking is huge, huge, huge. And when I say huge, $5,000 of a $15,000 claim, I'm pretty sure everyone would say was huge, right? In addition to your deductible. So if you don't have code upgrade coverage, you are going to be paying out of pocket or you're gonna move forward with an illegal roof. That's outside of my you know, expertise. Or, so it's a little more complicated, as, okay. as many things in insurance are, just love this. Okay, so I'm gonna explain some of the things I know, and then you can make the decision that's best for you. If you have one by eight boards on your attic, and the spacing between the boards is larger than a quarter of an inch, you're required by code to redeck. This issue is extremely common. I would say on older homes, I'm running into it about over 50% of the time. Like I have to inspect every attic, whereas a long time ago, didn't even think about it. Yeah. What's older homes? Anything that's not new construction, so built in the last 10 years, maybe even less than that. Cause see the 2015 code was adopted by Oklahoma not that long ago. When I'm talking about codes, I'm referring to the International Residential Code, IRC. 2015, that's what we're on. But then you also have to look at the actual adopted version with the modifications to confirm that that giant code book is actually code. So if you're wanting to know what these codes are and you have lots of time to research it, that's what you need to look for. 2015 IRC and then look up Oklahoma building code adopted, something like that, and it'll come up. He didn't even go in the attic. He didn't? No. He probably just looked in there. He, he, once he saw it was one by eight boards. There's only one way to get into the attic is through my house. The insurance adjuster or the kind of contractor? No, the ins like insurance person. They never do because they, they don't, don't. They okay. expect you to prove it to them that they that needs to be. They're not going to bring it up. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> they won't. So that I inspection process is flawed. And they, the, the people that train the adjusters, I think, know this, but the adjusters, you have to remember, they give them a lot of claims, they don't have a lot of time to work them, and so they're not inspecting anything that they are not aware of that they need to inspect. It's very unfortunate. So if you have the code and ordinance coverage on your insurance policy, and your house was built in 1950 and has those 1x8s with a quarter inch in between each board. Or a grade, it has to be greater than that, but yeah. That's something that if you were to file a hail and wind claim on your house, yep. and that was the case, that's something you could bring up to the insurance company? You definitely should. Yeah, it, uh, if, if the risk totaled, yes. Right, right. Has to be part of the loss. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a lot of roofing manufacturers that will void their warranty if it's on a one bay roof. Yeah, so like I said, this issue is complicated. Well, the reason why I threw out the quarter inch or larger is because the, the code is tied to the manufacturer specifications and the, the main manufacturers make this the issue. The, the deck boards are too wide. 
And there, there is a good reason for it. They're tied, they don't want to pay warranty claims when the nails are missing the deck boards. If the nails miss the deck boards, the expansion contraction, I'm not a construction guy, but the, the expansion and contraction uh, it wears out the roof quicker than what they're warranty for. Now they're giving these, they call them lifetime warranties. They're not lifetime, but there's all, it's like it's a lifetime warranty and then there's like pages of exceptions. So, but anyway, they don't want to pay warranty claims, and so they're like, no, we need a solid decking. Now this issue is pretty well known amongst the adjusters, so if they're not vetting it out at the beginning of the claim, they're intentionally, I would say, in most cases, overlooking it to save time at the cost of Paul Silver, by the way. So. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the issue on decking. Most of you don't have it because you're real estate investors, and when you go get quotes, the agents know you are cheap. <laughs> so your cheapness is causing you to lose thousands of dollars at claims time. So all you need to do is very simple. Ask your agent, I want a replacement cost policy. I want code upgrade coverage. And I want replacement cost value based on how much it would cost to rebuild my house. If you want to quote me less, that's fine but I need that one to go off of. So you, you compare them and then you can make an educated decision. What most people do not realize is code upgrades only cost like 20 or 30 bucks a year. Okay. That's right, I, I added it all online. Oh, it's awful. I was on the phone with an agent just the other day who he, and his words were basically, well, I didn't know it was an issue and I just thought, you know, it, would not, it wasn't an issue. So I didn't even offer it to the customer I'm like you're in the business of selling insurance you didn't even offer the code upgrade coverage like guys if you hear that that's not ever been an issue this is not true everything has as, as long as there's been building codes there's been code issues on claims unless the house is wiped off the slab or totaled you're gonna have code issues on any kind of complicated loss now the decking that's a little more recent but it's still years it's not like it happened last year. No, this has been going on since 2015 and maybe since 2012. I don't know. I'm a realtor and I, I work with a lot of insurance companies. I get quotes. They have never, ever suggested that until I just learned that last year. They well, have, I mean, I've they like never so suggest it, but the really good agents don't even think not to include it. Like it's, it's automatically, like if you're a homeowner, a lot of time and with a, one of the larger companies, it's just an automatic coverage. But because the insurance companies are really smart, this is my opinion, they're really smart, right? So as soon as that code became, started being enforced and started being adopted, they like it, I think, gave lack of training to the agents and let them kind of like not sell it kind of like the, the error of omission. Let's not tell them about it so that when we have all these hail claims come in in Oklahoma because we know we get hail storms, we can save $5,000 a claim. I mean, that's, that's kind of, it's horrible and I wish it weren't the case, but why didn't this agent I just talked to who is a really, it's one of the largest carriers in America yeah. and a very busy agent said he had hundreds of clients. Why was he not selling it to them? I have no idea. I don't know. So we'll talk about that errors and omissions a little bit again. So if your agent makes a mistake, okay, that can be an actual error or an error through omitting information. If you are using an agent, then your the understanding most insureds would have, and I would say is the correct understanding, is that your agent is supposed to look out for your interests and to make sure there aren't any large coverage gaps that you're missing. Now, if your agent says, hey, I recommend this Cadillac policy, and you say, no, I want the cheapest possible coverages, give me that. Well, then the agent did their duty because you're the, you're the consumer, you're the one that ultimately decides what you want to be exposed to. If they don't do that and at least offer you the coverage, I don't know. I, like my, one of my insurers just said, that's definitely an omission in his point because he was, he was completely in the dark until I went out to his claims. It was like, uh, yeah, you don't have code upgrade coverage, but I'm gonna put it on the claim, but they're not gonna pay it, right? Well, if the agent makes an error or an omission and you can prove it, sometimes the carrier is bound to the agent's mistakes and will have to pay it under the claim. Sometimes they're not. 
Sometimes they're completely independent and they have no response. They don't have any binding authority to the agent, and then you have to sue them directly. Yep. Is there any time a code upgrade coverage will not be enforced because you do not have something else on your policy that coincides with that coverage to enable it to? No, if you have the coverage, okay, so as with all things insurance, it's very complicated. But the insurance companies are getting tired of paying for these things, and they just offer it because of competitive pressures in some cases. And so they are creating this fancy language I've seen in some policies, but not here, where it says, well, if it wasn't to code when it was supposed to be code, then we don't cover it. So it's like an even further exception to the exception to the exception. It's so crazy. So that's why my answer can't be directly yes or no, but it's because some insurance carriers have caught on that some insurers will do repairs, maybe that are not even part of an insurance claim, don't do it to code, maybe because the contractor doesn't tell them they have to, and then come claims time, they find out, well, it was code to have these boards and you just replaced your roof a year ago, so now we don't owe you for that. God, I hope that doesn't become mainstream. It, as it stands right now, the most uh, prominent answer to that question is if it's not to code at the claims time and you have code upgrade coverages and it's damaged then you're entitled to bring it up to code at that time if it's installed completely improperly probably have to install it properly now that's my that's the general answer to your question good question how am I doing on time I don't even know 20 minutes I got 20 minutes left oh okay um, so, yep. say if we go out and just hire an attorney, wouldn't we come out better? Hey, you know, sometimes, but here's the thing you got to remember about um, attorneys. So if you're going to look for an attorney, you need to make sure they're specialized. They need to be bad faith insurance attorneys if you're going to sue on an insurance claim. In Oklahoma, this is not legal advice. Are we all clear that I'm not talking as an attorney, right? <laughs> so in Oklahoma... If you sue an insurance company and lose, you will owe their attorney fees. If you sue them and lose, they will collect their attorney fees from you personally. Which if you go through a trial, you're looking at, you know, $100,000. So you better be right. So this is the reason why attorneys don't take claims that you think are claims to court because it's a risk. They don't necessarily explain this to you. There's an attorney sh sh uh, fee shifting provision. So your claim has to be really legit. Now that also goes the other direction. If you sue an insurance company and win in Oklahoma, then you'll get your attorney fees. So, and the good thing about suing insurance companies, I guess, it's a good thing, is that they always pay once the judgment's final, but you know, <laughs> that's not the issue. Yeah. The issue's getting to that. If they have attorneys on on staff all the time and they're good at it they know how to defend claims um and if you've never been in a deposition it's could be eight to 16 hours long about all things not related to your case <laughs> so <laughs> just keep that in mind like every document you have every email you have all your text messages all your call records all the pictures you've ever taken all the emails you send to your public adjuster <laughs> are discoverable. So when I get involved in a claim, I tell people, look, everything you say to me or send to me is discoverable. Keep this in mind. Don't, I am not your attorney. You do not have a client privilege, whatever you tell me. So if you tell me, hey, no, I don't think this roof is damaged, but can you submit the claim for me anyway? That conversation, discoverable. I take good notes, record most of my calls. So if you've said it, you're toast. <laughs> All right. Ian, yeah. Have you double teamed with an attorney and won a case? Yes. I had a, um, a heat and air unit. The insurance company paid the roof and everything, but, and they paid to comb the AC fins. Really common, really common. And no one ever does it. Well, if you, were combing your fins on the AC unit after being hit by hail, you would find out that if there's more than a few dents, it can't be combed and you need a new air conditioning unit. Well, since the Freon situation now created an incompatibility with the new system, you now need an entire system. 
So all these claims where they just did AC fins and you didn't think anything of it because you were concerned about the roof, you might have lost another eight grand on an AC unit. This answers your question. I got involved in a claim where all that was done except for the AC unit wasn't addressed other than coming the fins. Well, I love that they pay for coming the fins because that opens coverage for the AC unit. Mm -hmm. So I send a technician out who charges two to 400, writes the report, says, yeah, I can't comb the fins, needs to be replaced, and by the way, it's not compatible, right? Send that to the insurance company. I got a guy whose manager I actually knew from when I worked at the air carrier. Anyway, they send out this company called HVACI. They only work for insurance carriers. Their job is to write repair reports on air conditioner units. <laughs> I meet this guy on the on the lost site, he inspects and whatnot. I say, okay, well tell me what you're doing. I can't because it's secret. Really? <laughs> I mean that's basically his response. I can't tell you what I'm doing, I'm not telling you what I'm taking pictures of, I ain't doing any of that. I'm like, well, but then what if you anyway, I got him a little miffed enough. I pushed enough of his buttons that he left without completing his report and then went on to completely misstate what happened. He basically told the carrier that he did inspect when he actually canceled his own inspection halfway through. Anyway, had all this recorded, because all of my inspections are recorded. Fast forward, they get the report. Once I proved to the carrier that they did not complete their inspection, they then, HVACI, created a report that said, okay, that's fine, here's the repair cost. So we got that back and it was still short by about 400 bucks. I was like, oh no, we're not doing this on $400. I was like, uh, yeah, you're gonna pay the whole amount. So we sent the bill in, they paid everything but the 400, they were staying their ground. We did a small claims court action, me and the policyholder and an attorney, and he won just under 10 grand. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so I have documented all the statutory violations, and um, I'm actually one of the only people I know of, even be attorneys, I literally helped obtain, and it's on public record, a journal entry of judgment against a carrier that specifically says they committed bad faith, and that judgment is final and not appealable. <laughs> <laughs> to total overall cost, the claim was how much? I don't know. I wasn't involved in all of it. I only got involved on the AC issue. So. Just the AC issue, but that, that point right there. Okay, and then for the group, what was your fee charge on handling it? I charged 10% of the replacement cost value plus my expenses. Expenses on a hail claim are going to be a few hundred dollars. Your chalk. I don't charge for chalk, but I do charge for mileage. <laughs> <laughs> when you're doing support on a claim like that, though, it can be intense. Do you charge any additional for that? Not as long as you hired me on a fee basis, a, okay. temper, a percentage basis. 10% of claim is that what you said? Uh, yeah, so I always get that question, and I want to make sure this is really crystal clear. It's not 10% of your claim, right? Everyone understands that to be a different number. I charge 10% of the replacement cost value that's approved by the carrier, which is the big number. So if you chose to get horrible coverages, right, my fee is not based on your decision of choosing horrible coverages or your deductibles. Some people get high deductibles. So the way that I balance this issue is if you have ba a bad coverage and a really high deductible and you're ta calling me on a health claim, I'm going to tell you you're out of luck. You need to file your own claim. I will help you. You can call me and ask questions and I will help you. I will answer your questions, but I am not taking that claim because you're not going to be happy with me at the end. Because if they approve fifteen thousand, but they give you a check for five, and I'm taking fifteen hundred, you still can't get the roof done. I don't get take claims like that. If you want to avoid that situation, send me your policy because I look at policies for free. A lot of people don't know that. That was my next question. <laughs> yep, I look at policies for free. So, oh, I how much time do I have? There's one really big issue. I gotta talk about. Okay, we got plenty. You're okay. good. Just go. Coinsurance, guys, cheap <coughs> investors. <laughs> this is another cheap investor problem. So coinsurance, <laughs> your agent doesn't really know a lot of times about this issue or how it applies. They don't think it's important. The reason they may not be, this may not be on the radar is because if they're always dealing with homeowners who live in their house, everybody wants 
top dollar coverage. I probably paid top dollar amount for the house. You know, retail people pay good money. They want good money coverages. The agents write policies that way. We don't run into this problem. This only becomes an issue because investors want the cheapest quote. So what happens is when you're annually shopping for your insurance policy, you're like, well, my premiums are too high. I'm gonna go shop around. What you don't tell them is all your specifications. And so they write you the cheapest quote. Well, part of that quote, and actually a really big part, is how much the cost, how much is the house to rebuild? If you go buy any house out here, I don't care how much of a dump it is, okay? The replacement cost value means if it were to burn down, how much would it cost to rebuild it today? With today's construction prices, right now, how much would it cost? It's a 105 a foot, like, or more. So if you're insuring your properties for $50 a foot, you guys just don't have any idea what happens at claims time. I'm about to tell you, you're gonna love this. So first of all, coinsurance is a penalty on top of everything else that they deduct. They will deduct also the coinsurance penalty if you do not insure for at least 80% of the rebuild value. Not what you pay, the rebuild value. So if you have a thousand square foot house and you insure it for 50,000 and you have a $10,000 claim, $2,500 deductible, $2,500 in depreciation, we're at 5,000. Now, after they've deducted depreciation deductible, your net check would be 5,000, right? Oh no, wait, you only insured for half the value. We're gonna deduct half of that out right there. Boom, 2,500, that's coinsurance. It is deadly to your claim. You will not be able to get the repairs done. Impossible, Impo unless you did all the work yourself. And even then, you're gonna be, you're gonna be hurting. Yeah. Your standard, industry standard for replacement cost here in Oklahoma, $105. 105 is a good rule of thumb. And the reason I say that is, most houses are, that you're gonna be buying are average or even a little below average construction grade, so as long as you're insured 80% of that number, you're good. So I suggest 105. So, so a comment on that. So I, I just switched most of my stuff over to farmers of all things. They had the best coverage, I thought, for the price, but that's not where I'm going with this. I went with the 80% coverage because everything they quoted at 100% coverage came out to about, um, about $145 a square foot. Well, and yeah. so that's a, an agent really making sure you're covered. Right? right. Well, that that was their standard. So I cut it back to 80%, which still brought it in at like $125 a square foot. So and it's not 145. <laughs> if you go to Edmond, they're used to quoting these really ridiculous prices. Right. So um, just keep in mind, it's about 105 and you deduct sure, out the right. land value. So right. go, go, go see a, a new house, right? Brand new build. See how much they're listing it for. Deduct 50,000. Divide that number by the square footage. You have about what the construction costs are a year ago, basically the way that works. Yeah, so I, the, the big companies, they're trying to way over insure and bump that price. That up. was, yeah, that's actually, that issue has, was actually well before the co-insurance issue, which is really common now for investors. So it's now opposite. The pendulum has swung all the way to the other yeah. side. Well, let's compete on price. You never want to compete on price in insurance. You always want to ask for specific coverages and then have them quote you that price. Now, if you're going to insure close to 80%, right? I'm telling you it's probably not. You're probably actually correctly insured in this instance. But let's assume you insure you insured a property for $80 a foot. It is absolutely imperative that you know that rebuild is not calculated until you actually have a claim. So, that means you need to reevaluate that every single year and you better be diligent because if it's if it comes in low because construction prices have increased you're going to get hooked by that co-insurance penalty now there is there is one policy out there what they do instead of hitting with the co-insurance penalty they make it actual cash value instead of replacement costs so the policyholder in that event thinks they're covered for replacement when they're actually not they're covered for actual cash value which means de after the de deductible and the depreciation. Brutal. Brutal. I got one other question. Yeah. Hang on, let me get his. Okay. So, already got. so I have a question. So we like to invest in, in like Panama City, so there's a lot of hurricane damage I was there. Right now. I, heard, I handled a hurricane claim out there. Okay, so if you're only covering 
80% of the damages, and then after the hurricane, they always jack the prices up like crazy. So how are you able to cover yourself in a situation like that? If it's a house you live in, then you should be getting extended replacement costs. That's what it's called. And it, it'll usually provide an additional 25% or so in the event that the construction prices are not up to par in that situation. Yep. The key with keeping that coverage active is you have to report any additions or remodels that are worth $5,000 or more to your agent. In yeah, reference to his question, mm -hmm. also when your plywood doubles, all you got to do is go to three suppliers to get the price of the plywood and give it to the adjuster. Okay. Same thing with all other materials, right? That's what we've done. Are you talking about from a contractor standpoint? I'm talking about from replacement cost. In other words, from a fire. We had a three and a half million dollar fire job. Mm -hmm. The. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, you're saying to confirm material prices. <laughs> the only problem with doing that is you yeah. shoot yourself in the foot because the contractors are entitled to their markup. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is twenty or thirty. But I'm just talking about the cost of the material. Yeah, if you, if, you, if you send that to yep. the insurance company from your material supplier, they right. will pay you based on that, and you've cut yourself out of your markup, which is you're entitled to as a contractor, so you should not do that. Okay. You're entitled to 20 30% markup on materials? Think about it this way. How many times have you managed your own remodel and had to run back and forth from the store because you bought the wrong item, and then you also spent the time to price shop it, and then it's the wrong color, or the, in, or the customer's too, too strict, or it doesn't quite fit, all of that is time that you are absorbing yourself. You're entitled to be paid for your time, and that time is part of a contractor's markup on their materials. Right. So that's my position on it. But if, you, if you're if you insured, and this is your one claim, and it's your only house, send them the material receipts, because you don't need to be compensated for your markup. So there are two answers to your question. So I'm sure I'm not the only one sitting in this room thinking, man, I did one really wrong. What's the time limitations for you to come out? Oh, that's a great question. Else? Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something <laughs> that uh, you're not going to hear this, but from a public adjuster or plaintiff's attorney, probably. <clears throat> it, it's really unfortunate, too. So, back in the day, if you presented a claim to your insurance company because you have a contract with them, they would honor the contract, adjust the claim, and pay you. No matter how long, as long as you did not prejudice their right to investigate. That's, that fits perfectly with hail claims because you don't know about them when the loss happens oftentimes unless you were home and witnessed the hail or unless the tenant called you and told you about it. So it's easy to come across hail claims that are two or three or four years old. Okay, well, the insurance companies are always, I think, looking to kind of cut their payout, right? They want to trim their claims. Well, one of the ways they're doing it luckily it's not as common in Oklahoma, is they're enforcing what's called a suit limitation. There's a provision in every insurance policy that changes the five, what normally would be like a five year deadline to sue, right? If you have a contract and the other party breaches it, you normally get five years to sue on that contract from the date of the breach. Well, insurance companies always lower that down because they can cut out a lot of their exposure just by not being able to be sued. It's like a technicality. So they lower that statute of limitation down to usually one year. And it's not from the date of the breach, it's from the date of loss. So if your hailstorm happened March 23rd of this year, you're about to lose your ability to sue because your attorney needs to investigate it and you have to have a dispute to sue on before he can file your case. So if you're thinking, well, I just waited over the season. Um, you know, I sh I'm just gonna wait till next March. Okay, but you're rolling the dice that you're gonna have a dispute with the insurance carrier and they're gonna say, well, that may be the case, but we're not gonna pay. And you're gonna go to an attorney and he's gonna tell you, well, show me your policy, because that's, the, that's what they're looking for when they want your policy. And they're gonna say, well, it's too late. You say, well, well, but they did all these bad things. None of that matters because you can't sue them after the deadline. One year of data loss. That means you need to have your claim reported and investigated and a dispute on file with the insurance company before the one year and with enough time for an attorney to completely investigate it, which is at least 30 days before you can file. So if you think you have a claim on anything, water, fire, tornado, anything, 
before you call your insurance company, call us. Yeah, call an adjuster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Take Go care from the very beginning. I'll tell you what you got. I don't charge for coming out and looking. Okay. Yep. Correct me if I'm wrong on this, but gold nugget that I use on all houses that I purchase, mm -hmm. I include a clause at no expense to the seller. I reserve the right to use his insurance policy at the time of closing. And I would say 30% of the homes that I purchase, I get the risk replaced from the seller's insurance policy and yep. it doesn't be my insurance policy that's an awesome thing and you're you're almost n no one knows to do that it's an assignment of claims proceeds my preference is that the assignment takes place after you know there's a claim because an assignment before there's a claim might not be valid according to the terms of the policy so just an FYI so you need to establish that there is a claim and then get them to sign the assignment of claims benefits a lot of insurance people that think that's illegal somehow to assign a claim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They say that, but the, what they're missing is you can't normally assign the policy, but you can assign the claim proceeds and the rights to the claim after the claim is in place. Do you have a form for that? Yeah, yeah I do. I have language, but I'm not an attorney. <laughs> mm, I'll make sure y'all know. Yeah, I don't want to talk. So all you got to do, I've got it. Um, it's really simple. Can I email it to someone and then you can send it out to everybody? There, It's assignment language that you do before closing and then at closing you have to assign it at closing. My language says cooperate with the public adjuster. So when you get it, you, can you might need to modify it a little bit if you don't want a public adjuster involved. But do know the insurance carrier may not cooperate with you. Just because you assigned the claim proceeds to the buyer in that case, that doesn't mean the insurance company is going to agree and really be cooperative with you. You have to have the language in your contract if that check is given to the seller, he's gonna forward it back to you. Yeah, I know. But the insurance company may not agree. So it can be done and they should honor it but if they don't, they choose not to, your only repercussion to them is to sue them, which you don't want to do because it's probably not going to be worth it. So you want to make sure, my opinion is when there's a public adjuster involved in that, I don't even make them aware of the assignment because they don't need to know. Uh, what I do is I have the seller and the buyer both sign a public adjuster contract and I protect both parties and enforce the assignment because my name's on the check. So that could be outside of the transaction. Yeah. And, it, and in that case, you're still working with the original homeowner that sold yes, the home. Yes, and they're cooperative. They yeah. have to work. Yeah, they have to help They have to that. be willing yep. to do it. Yeah. Yes, and here's the thing. If you get a savvy seller, they're going to ask you for money to do that. But if they're not savvy, then they won't. So. Yeah. Sometimes that can be a very, very the transaction. Though. The benefit to the seller is they won't have a deductible. But if you're getting the house really, really cheap, you're probably they're probably not going to agree to assignment. I had a I had a guy that was savvy who was selling several houses. He wouldn't agree to the assignment. He didn't want to file a claim. I've wanted to do that, and they didn't have it. I have successfully done it. I did it on um, one of Dalton's, actually. Yep. I just got done doing that on a wholesale deal, actually. The, the seller was, I mean, the, the roof needed to be replaced anyway from that last hailstorm we had. And so we had the contractor go out there and take a look, and I think you actually inspected it as well. And we determined, yeah, and we're about to get, we're supposed to be getting the check from the insurance company today. That's awesome. And we're going to get that roof replaced and it sweetened the deal for the buyer. Good. The investor that's buying it to flip it. So. That's really good. Yeah. So the, the biggest thing on that is you have to ask the seller and you have to ask them more than one way. Did they file a claim? Did they keep the money? Because almost always they did. And if you go in there and you file that claim, you might get accused of insurance fraud because they'll they'll pull the prior claim if it has been paid for before. So make sure you vet that out. Yeah. Right. What is the Savvy Boot Camp? Are you struggling to get to the next level as a business owner, as an investor? Do you want to multiply your income? Sign up for the Savvy Boot Camp, a strategic and supercharged one night and one day event designed to shortcut your learning process and propel you forward. Just value, no upsells, and an intimate setting to build relationships with like-minded investors. We will be covering how personality profiling can make you a millionaire. 
outsourcing, and the nitty-gritty of maximizing your property management, scaling your business through systems and automation, technology hacks you should be using every day, and how to raise private money. Go to www.savvybootcamp.com now to register or to find out more. Thanks for listening to the Savvy Radio Show. Glide online and listen to our other motivating episodes at SavvyRadioShow.com. Connect on Twitter at LandlordBook and always be buying assets.